Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to another episode of Black Bald. My name is James D. Fiore. Um, it's not often that you have a guest where it's almost impossible to promote it because of the current social climate that we uh, currently live in. Um, but we're going to do our best today. Uh, she's a lovely woman. She's a professor. Her name's Kathleen Stock, and she her claim to fame, I guess you could say, is that she speaks out on what a lot of people, including myself, feel is sort of like a trans ideology that's permeating throughout society and um, somewhat unnecessarily. Uh, she is also the author of a new book, and her book is entitled Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. Um, full disclosure, I have not read the book yet, but I'm not even sure. Uh, I, I did order it a couple days ago, but I live in the sticks uh, up in Canada, so there's no, uh, you know, I haven't read it yet, but there's so much other information out there um, about uh, this wonderful woman. Her name is Professor Kathleen Stock, and we are welcoming her to the show right now. Professor Stock, thank you for coming to Blackball today. Thank you for that lovely introduction. No, no problem at all. So, I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that this issue um, is almost impossible to talk about if you look at it through a lens of not wanting to get trashed <laughs> online. <laughs> and I, you know, <clears throat> there's all these new rules about talking about social issues. Um, if you're like me and you're a straight white guy, you might as well just grab a lawn chair and just sort of watch it all play out because not many people are interested in what we have to say. And that's fine. But the thing is, is that when I listen to someone like yourself speak with such clarity and eloquence and you still sort of get murdered online, um, it bothers me. So maybe we can start off by um, you telling us how this issue first sort of made you a household name and why it did and and maybe we can go from there i'm not quite a household name yet <laughs> i've God. heard of you i've heard of you all over all, all across you. the pond over here yeah um well i i'm a philosopher i'm an academic philosopher at a british university and um like in canada and the states um this uh, conflict between um, claims made in the name of trans rights, which I don't actually always think are in, in the service of trans rights, but we'll get to that, I'm sure, and uh, conflict between that and women's rights um, has been uh, bubbling away. And I just couldn't believe that no academic philosophers um, were getting involved from from the perspective of women's rights. So there's plenty of academic philosophers who are very enthusiastic about the recent rapid social changes we've seen in favor of this thing called gender identity, but you weren't hearing the other side and I am on the other side. I think there are many conceptual and practical issues around gender identity. So I want to start talking about them basically. So I started writing blog posts and then that picked up some steam and I started doing talks and writing things for publications like The Economist and um, others. Uh, but I also started getting, uh, you know, um, quite a lot of flack, let's say. Yeah. And I mean, is it is it fair to say I, I really have not peered uh, into your background to figure out where your politics are or anything, but mm -hmm. um, Maybe I'll just keep it personal and then ask you if you have if you share a similar experience. But I always thought I was a progressive until uh, identity politics came along, and now I'm apparently a rabid member of the alt right because I don't agree with the fundamentals of identity politics. Or, do you have a similar background? Is that sort of where you come uh, from as well? I'm a. I've always voted left. I've never voted Tory. Um, I. I've never been that fond of identity politics, but didn't have much reason to question it. It didn't speak to me particularly, but I didn't see its problems until I, um, you know, suddenly realized uh, that there was a huge clash in identity claims on behalf of these two groups and, um, and that the conversation around it was incredibly toxic. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not in the outright, although yeah. I'm frequently accused of it. You are uh, now. <laughs> well, it's just preposterous. It's just another. What I realized very quickly when I got into this that my antagonists, like my critics, will use any tool they can find to get me to shut up. And if that means saying I'm aligned with Donald Trump, which they have said, or that I'm an idiot, or that I'm a bigot, um, 
you know, or whatever that whatever they can find, they'll they'll use. And so after a while, it just starts to wash over you. I mean, I know who I am. I'm also gay. I'm a lesbian, so okay. Uh, I'm coming from within the L, the the famous LGBT community that really <laughs> isn't a community, but um, yeah. I've learned to call it the LGBETC community because I don't know how long that acronym is going to go for until all the letters are gone. But um, that's that's neither here nor there. Listen, I, I, I don't know how to approach this issue uh, most of the time. Um, and even mm -hmm. now, because it, it feels like it's just, it's wrought with pitfalls and things like that. But I can't think of another issue uh, other than trans activism and, and, and like the real extreme end of it that sort of encapsulates all these other issues at the same time. Issues like free speech, issues like women's rights um, and things like that. And why... I guess the I guess when I boil it down, the question that I have, and it's not even a question for you. I guess it would be for more trans activists, but maybe you you know what they're what the answer is. But why do trans women, for example, have to claim women's spaces and not just create spaces for themselves? Well, that's a really good question, and I think um, I mean you're right that in a sense it's not my question to answer on their behalf but I can tell you the two answers that come up most frequently when I've asked that question um, because I would be all in favor of in fact in my book I argue that we should be arguing for spaces where everyone can feel comfortable and where um, we're reducing the chance of harms in those spaces for everyone um, but the two answers that come up most frequently are first of all well we're women QED, you know, <laughs> we're women, therefore we should have access to every single context in which women are mentioned, um, including changing rooms, uh, showers, dormitories, bathrooms, uh, resources for pregnant women, you know, and so on. Um, and if you don't like that answer, then the other answer is um, because it's dangerous for us. I mean, if you're talking about the space issue in particular, mm -hmm because it's dangerous for us in men's spaces would be the the answer. So it's a kind of, um, uh, I would say <clears throat> somewhat emotionally blackmailing women uh, of the old, old sort um, into moving up and making room and basically accommodating trans women because of male violence. You know, it's not women that are, uh, are being violent towards trans women but women are being expected to bear the cost. I mean, and I think it's worth explaining what those costs are because so frequently my position is just presented as some kind of squeamishness or distaste. And my position is that, you know, there is a um, huge problem of male violence against women. So the, the vast majority of sexual assault is committed by males against females. And we have as a society, thank goodness, develop social norms to try and protect women where they undress and where they sleep and where they're vulnerable to sexual assault from males. And single sex spaces is just was just a kind of no brainer <laughs> in that regard. For years, nobody really thought about it. And of course, passing trans women and passing trans men might use those spaces, but um, there was never any push to make um, gender identity, the feelings you have inside the criteria of entry into those spaces. And that's what we're seeing now in Britain anyway, and I'm sure you're seeing it in Canada too. So now we're yeah. told that it's, gen it's how you self-ID. doesn't matter how, whether, you're, whether you've had surgery, what your body's like, what you're wearing, it's how you feel that gives you the right of entry into these spaces. Now that disrupts that, so that safeguarding social norm for women because they can no longer identify from the outside who's supposed to be there and who isn't. Males can just walk in and say, I feel like a woman. I am, I'm, I have a right to be here. And that puts women at risk, not from trans people specifically, but from malfeasant males. <laughs> yeah, know? so that's I've, the problem. I've always made that argument and, and it falls on deaf ears, but it's not a anti-trans or transphobic argument to say that sometimes um, a male bodied person will go into say a rape crisis center and assault somebody. It's actually an argument against me. <laughs> it's an yeah. argument against straight males co-opting the trans identity in order to find victims. Yes, um, it's it's. I mean, if you take the, it's not a character reference for males um, saying that there should be single sex spaces because most males are not sexual offenders. One hopes, <laughs> but you know, some are, and 
it's I've only really assaulted myself, but go ahead. Good. Yeah. <laughs> but it's excluding the many um, in order to protect women from the few. And that goes whether the trans women, the, the, sorry, the males are trans women or not. And I mean, another aspect to this sort of craze for gender identity is that we're no longer allowed to mention the fact that trans women are males. There's a huge effort to control speech, to remove any reference to sex. But the part of the point of this book is that sex is still a causal factor in all these different domains, in sexual assault statistics, in sport, um, in sexual orientation and how we describe and protect it. So we can't get rid of sex. It's still there and it's still having all these effects. It's just we can't name them anymore. So. Yeah, I've always had a, a problem with with uh, this new universe of genders because I, I joke with my friends. I'm like, you know, why isn't there an app um, that alerts us whenever a new gender is discovered, who discovered it, how they discovered it? And isn't the answer, like I'm just being a kind of an asshole about it, but isn't, isn't the answer because once you say that there's a spectrum, you can fill up those slots of those spectrums any way you want. And also, I have two kids, they're six and four. I get worried about them being introduced to the idea that there's this salad bar of genders that they can just choose from because they're probably gonna choose one of them because it's given to them as an option. When did critical gender theory become accepted and why did it seem to happen overnight with no input from anyone else? Well, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. Um, it, it's hap been happening for 50, 60 years incrementally, um, largely in academic spaces um, and also in feminist spaces. There's been a lot of contribution, unfortunately, and I am a feminist, but it, from some kind of uh, strains within radical feminist thought that have seen the sex as a social construct and have argued that it is. And, th and then also from um, what's known as queer theory so um, the idea that uh, binary categories generally, particularly when they're applied to human beings, are always pernicious expressions of power and that somehow we need to queer these binaries by um, uh, reconstructing the world in the way we want it to be because the assumption is that, it, it, you know, that everything is produced through language and there's nothing fundamentally naturally there independent of language all of that i disagree with as a philosopher completely none of it has any appeal for me whatsoever but it has a huge appeal <laughs> for a lot of academics not necessarily in philosophy actually in the humanities generally in literary theory and film studies and gender studies and they've just been off on <laughs> some planet as far as i'm concerned quite far away from uh, material reality for years and years but then at a certain point in in this century it gained popular traction. Um, some kind of highly derivative bastardized version of even the original academic ideas. Um, so now we hear that sex is a spectrum, uh, that intersex people, you know, that there's far more intersex people than we ever suspected, which isn't true, but they've been vastly overestimated. P intersex people are being politicized and mixed with the idea of trans people to give us the idea of this sort of, you know, gender free for all but you're right that um in in the sort of popular version of 75 genders on facebook or whatever it is it's meaningless it doesn't you know it's more like personality differences yeah than it feels anything like that's got anything to do with sex or masculinity or femininity anymore it feels like we're just sort of giving cute names to emotional avatars at this point like it does well, and i'm not yeah go ahead well i think there's there's many strands to this and yes in the popular in sort of um, I don't know, Tumblr world or Facebook, yes. And also that's very, very marketable to corporations, right? So you can, if there's, the more genders there are, the more things you can sell, the more ways you can brand things. But um, in policy, um, you know, I think there's not like 75 genders being recognized in law, but there are attempts to put gender identity, whatever that is, firmly at the heart of all these different policies, which is why you see in Canada, you know, male, rapists in women's prisons for instance um yeah. or you see that case that um you probably know more about than me but of a recent father who has been jailed for resisting the transition effectively of his child um and so he was put in jail because he called her daughter 
instead of sun. Oh, I looked at the case today just to remind myself, and that's <laughs> part of the reason. But I mean, he's got my position is he's got every right to refer to her by her sex. It is her sex, mm -hmm. and um, you know, we might want people to be. It, you might, you know, there's plenty of room to say that at least for adults, it's polite to call them by preferred pronouns, but it should never be compelled. And when it comes to children, it's completely different, obviously, because they're constructing their their picture of the world. They don't necessarily even know the consequences of what they're doing. They're making what look like irrevocable changes to their bodies through medical, through drugs, or or perhaps even through surgery. Um, I just don't think we should ever penalize a parent for having concerns about that process. And that seems to be what's happening. I was, I, I mean, it, it feels like nothing surprises me at this point, but one thing that did surprise me is the idea that without long-term research, we're giving kids puberty blockers and, and hormone therapy, and mm -hmm. in some cases, surgery, double mastectomies and things like that when they're like 15, 16. Um, yeah. And I find it abusive and I get called them a transphobe because I find it abusive, not just by people on the fringe either, but by mainstream people, many of which haven't even delved deep into this yeah. subject. They're just parroting what they think the right answers are because they want to be a good progressive. Yeah. And they're not being told by the mainstream progressive media either any different. So there's a complete dereliction of duty on the part of journalists and newspapers and, you know, broad, public broadcasters. But yes. So, I mean, the, what's happening to children, and it's, uh, and when you look at now at the data that is finally emerging, um, you see that there's a, a disproportionate number of same-sex attracted children or adolescents in this group of trans-identifying children. So it's highly likely that they are mis- or at least interpreting their own sexual attraction to the same sex as meaning that they're in the wrong body. I mean, that mm -hmm. interaction is possible. You should at least explore it. Then there's also um, a high proportion of autistic children in this group and children with trauma, history of anorexia. So it's a complex group of kids and adolescents. And trans activism is telling us we're not allowed to ask about any of that. We've got to affirm their gender identity, which is being conceptualized as this sort of inner fundamental essential fact about them that's just kind of bursting out and has got to be acknowledged it would be a crime not to it has to be recognized in law it has to be recognized by doctors it has to be recognized by teachers and parents that's a nonsense like there's no evidence that there's this innate thing that what there is is self-interpretation and it could be that you know it's good ultimately for you to interpret yourself as of a different sex but it doesn't mean you are of a different sex and it doesn't mean that that's a permanent state for you, that you should immediately change your body to, to fit this cycle. It's a psychological phenomenon. In other yeah. words, it's being treated as an essential fact about you. So, and, it, that, and, yeah. and it's interesting because the, like, <clears throat> I think there's a generational gap as well. I'm 44 years old. And when I grew up um, from, like, <laughs> from like 1983 to like 1990, um, every weekend, my my mom's softball team came over to to have a party and out of the 12 players i think nine of them were lesbians i knew so, you were going to say that <laughs> well that see, you, that you, 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 you're allowed to generalize lesbians yeah. i'm not but uh, <laughs> but but that was just what happened that was just what happened and so um i i grew up uh with a lot of gay people around me and so i i, I kind of got a, a I was fortunate enough to to not grow up anti-gay or anything like that, even though I was living in a climate that it was predominantly anti-gay. Like there was no one that came out in my high school, for example, in the 90s. Um, <clears throat> but the one thing that I thought of was this generational thing. So I tracked down um, one of the players that used to play with my mom and I had a discussion with her and she told me that if she was 16, 17 years old now, she would probably be told that she was trans or she might be confused into thinking that she was trans because she was, um, I don't know if the right word is butch or masculine or whatever when she was younger. Mm -hmm. And that might've been interpreted as so, some do-gooder person might want to help her by telling her, hey, listen, you might mm -hmm. want to check out this salad bar of genders and you might be trans. And then she was like, you know, maybe I, you know, maybe I would have gone down that road. So that plus the, the, um, detransition percentage is like this phantom stat that you can never really find because they work tirelessly activists to shield the public from these statistics. Yeah. 
Why? Um, what, what is their motivation at that point? <laughs> well, the motivation for the, the suppression of information about detransitioners is that it ruins the narrative I just mentioned, that this gender identity is kind of inside you waiting to come out. And once it's out, it can never be put back in its box. And somehow it's a permanent, re it, you know, you hear all this rhetoric. Um, I mean, in writing this book, I had to trawl through lots of popular books for kids and adolescents that say things like, you know, your gender identity and you discovering the real you, the authentic you. So once you've got all this idea of it being like a central feature of you, then the presence of a detransitioner who says it wasn't the real me, it was a phase. It was just an interpretation. It was where I was at the time and how I saw the world. That's incredibly uncomfortable for this narrative of positivity and affirmation. So it's another scandal of <laughs> the way that trans modern trans activism has gone, that these people who often many, many of them young, they've had some of them, you know, they've had breast removed, they've had their ovaries removed, they've had genital surgery in some cases, or they've just been on puberty blockers in a way that's reduced their sexual function, possibly reduced their bone density, their kidney function, there's all sorts of other consequences there too. These people are left hanging, <laughs> you know, they're rejected by their own community, the trans community that at one point affirmed them. And um, we don't seem to have, we're a few brave souls are now developing psychological protocols to help them, but they're not um, in any way a focus of activism in the same intense way. So they go through this incredibly fast as i understand it kind of shocking um almost like leaving a cult to be honest where you know you suddenly doubt everything that you truly believed and see the world completely differently and left with a lot of anger a lot of them because they weren't given proper talking therapy they weren't given alternatives as you say educators i'm not sure educators are sort of i hope educators aren't pre proactively going in and saying, do you think you're trans? But I think once a kid says I might be trans, there's no attempt to, in many progressive circles, there's no attempt to question that. And that's negligent. Yeah, and I think, um, I, I know this is, everything's controversial about this topic, but the rapid onset gender dysphoria theory, or what, I, I don't know if it's still a theory or if it's been proven, but <clears throat> the idea that um, say a girl in grade six will come out as trans and then immediately after that happens, like another four, five, six, seven girls in that class of 25 mm -hmm. kids will come out as trans as well. Um, but the stat that I was most interested in in that realm is that I think it's 70% of those girls are autistic. And what, what happens is, and I got this from Dr. Deborah So. So what happens is, is that they often... Um, they have such intense focus on something and something new was presented to them that they could focus on. And then that was it that they, that they, mm -hmm. they, they believe that. So it's incredibly confusing for children. And I, I and I'm still stuck in this place where I'm like, well, well, why isn't the, the priority to, to make sure that what this child is experiencing is real? Um, how powerful do you have to be attached to your narrative in order to just, blindly accepted so so you can have more power by numbers. I, I find the whole thing to be rather diabolical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about that 70% stat. I'm not saying it's wrong, it just seems a little high to me, but I do know that um, from everything I've read, there is a you know significant trend amongst trans-identified children and adolescents, maybe even people generally, actually, because I've read that um, also said um, by someone who works with adults that you know quite a large number ha are on the autistic spectrum. And yes, there's there's lots of um, accompanying traits when you're on the autistic spectrum that might explain the attraction, temporarily or permanently, of um, of thinking that you're trans or having having particular gender identity. Um, quite literal thinking, for one, um, mm. in some cases. So um, yes, it's the it, in terms of the the rapid onset stuff. I think it's not rocket science to work out that i mean this is this was like a fundamental tenet of um of social constructionism in a way the, the kind i'm familiar with people like ian hacking that you get what they call looping effects you know you get the more that somebody uh, a phenomenon has come to be known about socially the more 
people will start to identify themselves in terms of that structure. Mm -hmm. and, they want uh, comrades, right? Yeah, it's not. Yeah. I mean, and, and we've got social media, which is is supercharging this process, right? Since since everyone's got a smartphone and kids have got smartphones, then they can go onto Tumblr. So I've got a chapter in my book about which partly goes into this, the idea that, you know, you can curate your own identity online. You don't really get real time feedback from people around you physically because they're not in the same room as you. They can just endorse your fantasies and the fiction that you're immersed in. It's, you see it in game playing, people that get immersed in, um, in game playing online for, you know, 15 hours a day. It's not, I don't think it's that different a phenomenon in some sort of senses. You're immersing yourself in this alternative account of who you are. And um, sure, it's a partly a trend. It's not completely a trend. I think there's always been people who have gender identities at odds with their sex bodies. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But um, what's wrong with it is when what's wrong with what's going on is society has adopted this bizarre attitude to that. Um, but yeah, kids are and adolescents are subject to trends as we all are. Is there, just to sort of play devil's advocate or whatever, <clears throat> I, I feel like sometimes the far right ruins issues because once in a oh, while really? they, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> once in a while they're right about something and then if you agree with them, then that's it. You shit the bed because you agreed with the far right. Mm -hmm. So um, when I hear, uh, when I hear you say, and, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but that it's, um, it's more of a mental um, problem. Psychological. Psychological. Psychologic, so, sorry, psychological problem. Yeah, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. You know who did? Ben Shapiro. And that's what I thought um, of when you said psychological problem. And all I'm really saying, though, is, is that is, is that a big reason why it's difficult to have this conversation is well, because certain figures that yeah, are... I, not, yeah, go ahead. I just want to... Because of the very thing you're talking about, I didn't say psychological problem either. I said <laughs> psychological right. phenomenon. My bad, I don't my always bad. think yeah. it's a problem. And that's part of the book too. I go into like ways in which it might be creative and um, uh, self-fulfilling. You know, there's not one story here uh, to be told. We need to I, re I retract the problem. I retract the problem. I know, but I have to be <laughs> yeah, absolutely that's clear. Totally. You just keep <laughs> me in line. It's all good. It's all but good. yes, the general question. Um, well, look, one of the things that is now bizarrely, you know, on the table to deny is that um, is that binary sex exists. Um, it's now denied that you can change sex. So people think you can change sex. Uh, they think that men can become women. You know, so it's not surprising that a very big range of people will end up having problems with those views. Those are fundamental categories that we all, you know, took absolutely for granted up until recently. So I don't find it surprising that I'm on the same side, you know, broadly speaking, as a huge range of people who have some commitment to the idea of there being um, a thing called sex, males and females, <laughs> and uh, no transitions between those two states. Um, but that doesn't, you know, we it all think water, we all think water is wet, you know. But it, it feels doesn't, odd. Even, doesn't it feel odd even having this conversation? Because I can see your eyes darting sometimes. You're like, "How am I going to put this?" Because I don't want the <laughs> unnecessary people to come after me. So you know. But like, it, it, but the thing is, is that um, oh, first of all, what I wanted to know is that Boris Johnson. Um, I think uh, the one thing that I liked about uh, Trump is that he he decided to to go forward with prison reform. Otherwise, I think he's a rodeo clown. But Boris Johnson, who now, unfortunately for you, wears the crown as the goofiest leader on the planet, um, didn't he do one thing right and take away the self-ID provision that existed in the UK, or did he not take that away? No, no. Well, it's not that simple, and I don't think he did any of it. But um, So what we have in Britain is gender reassignment as a protected characteristic, and that's a process, and that's been um, protected for a while. And people on my side of the fence have no problem with that you know that's a that means you can't discriminate against someone who has gender reassignment but the move in Britain politically is to change this protected characteristic to gender identity and inner feeling rather than like a behavioral process or a surgical process or a medical process but something in a um to take away all gatekeeping all medical gatekeeping just to make it a formality I mean as it is in some places maybe even Canada actually I can't remember now but anyway. honestly, yeah, it's, it, I think you have to go through a couple of things and then you have to make a commitment to start the hormones. 
but I well, you but wouldn't I think... have to do that here. In fact, you don't have to do that here because gender reassignment is is defined so loosely that you don't need to take hormones either. But you do need to make some kind of meaningful commitment to living as the other sex. But self ID would just be you feel like you're a male today, you know, sign the thing now you are one. And so what's happened is that um, a big grassroots collective um, of activists including myself, if I can count that, <laughs> um, have pushed against that successfully with the Tories. So the Tories don't seem to be going ahead with that, although they are in the middle of a yet, an, um, or at least, sorry, we've got a parliamentary select committee in, in the middle of yet another inquiry into gender re gender reform. Uh, so it's still on the table, but if, if the Tories ever got voted out, then gender self-ID would be back, I think, because Labour still endorse it as a goal, in Scotland, it's very much um, front and centre because the ruling party there, the Scottish Nationalists, um, are in favour of it. So it's still around. The famous story out of the UK is, and I'm going from memory, is it the Karen White? Was that her name? Mm -hmm. his, his name, her name? Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure. So, and I don't want to butcher the story. Can you give the story? Because I don't think the Canadian audience knows about the story. And whenever I tell it, people don't believe me that it's true. <laughs> well, there's similar cases in Canada. I mean, you should read the Quillette article by April Halley. Um, you can Google Quillette Canada trans prisons, April Halley, then you will find mm -hmm. jaw dropping. And it's all evidenced. Um, but in the Karen White case um, came to notoriety because um, from... I think 2015-ish, uh, I'll have to double check, onwards, the policy in, in British prisons changed towards gender identity rather than having um, a gender recognition certificate or having had surgery on your genitals. So self-identified women who were males, who had had no medical intervention at all, and in some cases, in the case of Karen White, was a sex offender and a paedophile convicted was put in a women's prison where, and I'm going to use the word, I'm going to use the pronoun he yeah. for Karen White because Dude, I don't, yeah. I choose not to use preferred pronouns for men that have committed, convicted of violence against women. Mm -hmm. He assaulted um, two female inmates and at the trial for that, those assaults, the, um, I think it was his lawyer uh, uttered the words, at one point, her penis was sticking out the top of her trousers. So and that, was, that was recorded. So, you know, in we we are infiltrated, our national institutions are infiltrated to such an extent by trans activism that um, in, in the um, advice given to judges and to the judiciary, uh, victims of sexual assault by males who are trans identified women have to call them by their preferred pronouns, even when there's a conviction. That's coming. infuriating. That is infuriating. And yeah. <laughs> while I'm at it, and I'm sure, I don't know, maybe it's this way in Canada too, so you should check. But um, the crimes are then reported as women's crimes. Yeah. So we've seen a very strange uh, change in the demogra demographics of female crime in this, because suddenly in this country, because suddenly it now has um, a big increase in things like paedophilia, <laughs> which is not typically a woman's crime, but suddenly. And rape. And, and assault well. and violence. Like I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, you know, what is the stats gonna look like in 20 years um, when the murder rate and, you know, rape offenses among women increases by like tenfold? W what is that gonna tell us, you know? Well, I mean, at the moment, yeah, it's complicated because in the moment in Britain, I believe that you technically can't be charged with rape unless it involves a penis, but then, you know, women can have penises now we're being told so yeah. the law is obviously there is huge issues here to sort out and it's not being sorted out as long as our national institutions are being um, completely controlled by trans activism which is just looking at the consequences what they perceive to be the interests of trans people i don't think this is an interest of trans people either there's plenty of trans women that disagree with all this yeah and um uh, full disclosure, I, I have never considered myself a, a feminist um, per se. Like I believe in equality and all that, but I've never really tried to portray myself as a feminist because A, I didn't think that it, I, you know, it wasn't really something that I felt 
um, so passionate about that I would just include myself as part of the activists. Um, I just believe in equality and things like that until the trans issue came out. And now I'm really happy to be feminist because uh, I feel like it is so anti-women um, a lot of times and it manifests itself in a way where the only people that ever get victimized are women. And mm -hmm. I guess my question is why isn't the trans men part of this issue, uh, why doesn't it have the same sort of energy behind it? What is, what's the main meaning? And it's okay if that's because it's men that rule the other side, because I'm totally fine with hearing that. <laughs> I think there's, that is part of it. I think that, um, that I mean, the, all the sort of controversial areas around this issue are areas where the initial impetus has been from trans women to get into women's spaces, for instance, or to get access to women's shortlists. You know, they, you know, trans women can now be shortlisted for women's prizes or um, uh, sports. Sports. <laughs> yeah, I knew there was something else. Um, all sports, like so, women are trying to get trans women are on um, female teams. It's not so much the other way around. Now, in that case, there's an obvious reason for that it's to do with biological sex and the characteristics that biological sex, biological sex tends to produce um, in terms of strength and speed and things like that. But yeah, so I think that's that's really part of it. Um, but I mean, trans men are involved in the sense that they are active, they are in trans in modern trans activism. There are many trans men that would you know completely say, I was bigoted for saying all of this. Also non-binary people are a big part of this conversation who, who identify as neither male nor female or perhaps as both. So um, I think they're around, but um, perhaps in the most sort of, like I say, the most controversial areas, you'll see, you'll see trans women first. Um, another, another part of this story that I always find alarming is that the most successful female writer of all time is now clearly the most abused woman on the internet and no progressive ever bats an eye anymore. No one seems mm. to care. Well, I mean, I think some progressives do care. They're probably frightened. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about JK Rowling. I am, um, yeah. Partly what she did that was so brilliant is she tried to shine a light on what is happening. And that's what needs to happen because I, I, I think a lot of people still don't understand what the issues are what it all means they think it's something to do with sexual orientation they think they're, they're seeing it all through the lens of like well we weren't that great on gay rights and it turned out that gay rights didn't harm heterosexuals so why should you know giving trans people what they allegedly want um hurt, hurt non-trans people but it's not the same because there's not you know in this case there's redefinition of categories politically legally socially and that has an impact on nearly everybody so she was really trying to to shine a light on that and i absolutely respect her for it and i think she's probably brought this issue to many people's attention that didn't know about it but now other people need to step up to the plate and do the communicating as well because she she's just left on a limb if other people don't start explaining what's going on here yeah and it was sad to see like a bunch of the people that starred in her movies come out and speak out against her. I thought that was- Yeah, I meaning, was cowardly. Say nothing, if really, if, if, if yeah, you believe, exactly. you know. Um, she gave you everything you have, <laughs> right? You repay yeah. her by trashing her in the media. So, yeah, but, I mean, people should not listen to actors anyway, <laughs> just yeah, generally well, true, speaking. <laughs> true enough. Um, do you think then that it's a, um, that this is the, the, the type of issue where um, cause I used to get, I I've been sort of outspoken for the last decade on a whole bunch of identity issues, but this is a new one for me. But do you think that like all those other issues, I used to get emails from people saying, Hey man, I agree with what you're saying, but I can't say so in public cause I might get fired. Is there a lot of that here? I feel like the people that are really hardcore trans activists that believe in all the crazy stuff are a, a minority and the majority is that silent majority concept again, where the most of us are probably thinking, I don't know. It's, so I'm a little fucked up about this issue, but I don't want to say anything about it because I don't want to get in trouble. Are we at that place, you think? Yes, but I think that's that's just true generally. It's a minority of vocal people who are willing to, um, you know, imp they're willing to go like absolutely to from zero to 100 miles an hour in terms of like 
emailing your employer, calling you out on social media. You know, they they behave in they they engage in behaviors that most of us just would not dream of doing. Um, I don't want to fight those that fight me in those terms. I don't want to call for the jobs of those that call for the my job. You know, I just don't mm. want to do it, and that that really helps them to some extent because, um, you know, they have a open playing field. But um, I don't think this is. I think there's quite a lot of misunderstanding, and there's a lot of, a lot of neutrality because people think, well, I just don't know what's at odds here. I don't know how to jump. Like two sets of people seem to be saying that they're getting harmed and I don't know how to adjudicate this. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that the trans activist position is the majority one, um, you know, the extreme trans activist position, not at all, but there is a lot of fear. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're with uh, Professor Kathleen Stock and her new book is called Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. Can you give us a, an overlay about the book? And also, I was curious, did you have a hard time finding a publisher or was there any pushback on that? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about the second one first. So um, I got a publisher in Britain, a great publisher, Little Brown, um, and I'm delighted to have them up beside me, as it were. But it is true that I didn't get a publishing deal in America, for instance, or in Canada. So the book um, that will be sold in Canada from September the 21st is the British version. It hasn't been re rewritten for the for the US market. So it, it's about um, it's 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 really a philosophical kind of investigation written in as clear a way as I could possibly make it of the ideas behind gender identity ideology and the idea that your gender identity is a very significant thing about you that should determine um, your political and legal rights and, and, and also the idea that we should stop talking about sex because it's no longer relevant anymore. So I really go into ideas from people like Judith Butler and Anne Fausto Sterling and uh, Julia Serrano. Um, and, but I also present my own kind of positive take on these issues, I try to do it in a compassionate way. Um, because I really am not against, you know, I, I don't like this opposition between women and trans people. We should not be against each other. It's these crazy ideas that are getting <laughs> between us, but there's there should be solidarity. So I'm trying to um, forge us some kind of way forward um, mm -hmm. through the book, or at least open up a conversation. Well, um, I, I think this was a great conversation and um, I'm gonna end it there because, um, I don't know. I'm probably going to get canceled any second now if I, if I continue <laughs> doing this. No, but uh, I had a lovely time and I'd like to have you back on again, maybe uh, after the book's been out for a little while longer and yeah. we can talk about all your success. And okay. um, and thank you very much. This is uh, Professor Kathleen Scott uh, Stock, excuse me, again, the author of Material Girls. And thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Have a good day. Thank you. Um, yeah, sh She's amazing. Uh, you know, I did a lot of prep work for this uh, before I started, and I, I know it probably didn't look like it, but I get nervous talking about this subject still because I just find the whole topic to be just littered with landmines. But to have someone to speak um, so eloquently and with such clarity, um, and it doesn't hurt that she reminds me of the shortstop they used to play on my mom's softball team, so that's really cool too. Um, but we were so happy to have her here. And uh, this was episode six, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.